Kalle Dahlheimer. I'm the founder and CEO of um, Claude F. Dahlheim's Daughter Consult AB, or because nobody outside Sweden can pronounce that, KDAB for short. Um, I've been doing, I myself have been doing cute development for longer than I care to admit, which is about 10 years. So I've actually been using Qt since the pre 1.0 versions. And I've been on all kinds of uh, customer projects on doing both desktop development and embedded development together with my associates. We're a group of 18 developers in the KDAB group. And what I'm going to present you here is sort of I'm trying to take away from you the culture shock that desktop developers often have when they go to the embedded space. Because that's what we see time and again in our consulting projects. <coughs> the interesting thing is that this is not at all about APIs, especially when it comes to Qt and Qtopia Core. Because Qtopia Core is just Qt, and that's the beauty of it, because you can use the same skills that you've learned in terms of APIs, the classes that you've learned, the methods, and how to use them, how to put them together. You can use the same skills on the desktop and in embedded development. And that becomes even more obvious when, uh, when you look at what, it, what, what the product Utopia Core was called just about a year ago, that it was called Qt Embedded. And, and it's really just that. It's another platform for Qt, just as there's an X11 version of desktop Qt, a Windows version, and a Macintosh version, there's an embedded version that runs on embedded devices, which at this time have to run Linux. So it, this, is, this is going to be very little about the API, and that's not because I don't want to talk to you about it, but because I assume that's stuff you already know from your desktop development experience. The embedded specific API is maybe about 10% of the whole API, but really only about 1 or 2% of those classes and calls that you're actually going to use. And one of the really nice things about that is that you can do a lot of the work on your desktop in your, in your environment, design your screens, and then get it onto the embedded device. However, there are many other aspects that desktop developers typically don't think about when they go on an embedded device first. And it's these aspects I'm mostly going to talk about here. So I'll first say a few words about embedded development at all. What are the constraints? What are the challenges? What is, what is the fun about it? Um, I'll talk a bit about the development process. How do you work when you go to an embedded device? And a couple of special issues um, that newcomers to embedded development tend to forget about. Well, the good news, I've already told you, the API is pretty much the same. It's really, um, you will hardly be involved with any Qtopia core specific classes um, during the initial stages of development. And only when you, when you want to do some fairly specific optimizations, then you will need to look at the um, more embedded specific stuff. The bad news is the development process, once you go to the embedded device and you leave your convenient desktop environment, is not at all the same anymore. Because you have to look at completely different things. And that actually means you need to be ready to relearn application development. Things that you've taken for granted, like I can have a menu bar on my screen and I can have toolbars on my screen, are all of a sudden not granted anymore. Things like, ah, uh, well, I don't care about checking the, I don't care about uh, catching, um, catching memory allocation exceptions. Uh, because new always succeeds, because I have a gigabyte in my desktop machine anyway, right? Um, that's not the case in embedded development anymore. So. The, you need to focus at completely different things, in addition to all the software design, architecture, and technical things that you need to do as well. So I don't want to sound too negative here. Embedded development is great. It's a lot of fun, like all programming should be. Um, honestly, I still think that it's, that it's really wonderful that people pay me for something that I would do without money anyway. So. <clears throat> um, if I say that embedded development is harder than desktop development because besides all the desktop stuff that you need to know about, you also have the embedded specific challenges. I'm not, I don't want to sound too negative. Just, uh, I just sort of want to warn you and say, okay, you have another set of challenges that's going to be fun to solve. Like, do you remember when you got your first computer and you learned, assembler, learned to write in an assembler and you managed to write an animation and all of a sudden you managed to get uh, two extra frames per second out of that Motorola CPU? Wasn't that fun? Well, at least it was for me. So developing under those additional constraints is definitely harder. Be prepared to have slower progress initially, but it's also a lot more fun because you have, you have a different set of problems to solve 
and you'll feel a different kind of satisfaction once you get your application to run on a mobile phone, for example. And isn't that cool if you can have, like, you've all seen the green phone probably by now, if you can run around with your mobile phone and you have your own application on that? So what kinds of tools do we use? Qtopia Core is Qt for embedded systems. For now, Linux is going to be available on other embedded platforms later down the line. There's also a separate product called Qtopia. Um, right now only exists in the incarnation Qtopia phone. There are going to be others as well. And that is, I like to call that, in order to explain what it is, a desktop environment for systems that don't have one yet. If you work on a desktop, you're used to a desktop environment that provides services like, I can just tell the desktop environment to fire up the mail client. I can just tell the desktop environment to reboot or to change background settings or whatever. All that is taken for granted. Windows developers have it anyway. Macintosh developers on Unix systems, you typically pick one of the available add-on desktop environments like the KDE project that I helped start more than 10 years ago uh, or like GNOME or you may even have like Sun-specific or um, IBM-specific environments there. So even though the name is very similar, Qtopia Core and Qtopia, these really are at two different levels of abstraction. Qtopia Core is really cute for embedded. Qtopia is something on top of that that you use together with Qtopia Core. That's something that I see time and again that our customers um, easily confuse when they look at what do we really need for our development. So anybody from Toltec Marketing in here? No, that's sales. Uh, we see anyone from Toltec Marketing in here? So you just close your eyes for now. Uh, I think that naming is confusing. And so do a couple of other people as well. Maybe go back one slide here. This is Linux development. So if you come from a Windows or a Macintosh environment, you have to learn something else. In addition to the embedded specific stuff, you have to learn the tools that are available on Linux, which aren't really as scary as the Linux developers like to tell you, because it makes them look like real programmers, real with a capital R. Most devices won't allow you not for technical, but for practical reasons to compile directly on the device. The device is just going to be too small to run any decent compiler on it. And it's going to be too slow anyway. And how do you really start the compiler at all? So that's why in embedded development, you usually use a cross compiler, which is a compiler that runs on your desktop on one CPU, but produces binaries for another. For example, it could be a compiler that runs on an x86 CPU but produces binaries for some kind of X-scale CPU. So this is, there's an additional level of indirection. There's not only that you go from C++ code to assembler to binary code, which mostly the, the compiler does for you anyway, so you don't really think about that much anymore, but also the compiler runs on a different CPU than the output it creates for. So after the compiler is done, and of course the linker, the whole tool chain, the bin utils need to support that. Once these are all done with their work, you hopefully have a binary for your embedded device. And then you take those binaries, you download them to the embedded device via some kind of connection, something I'll be talking about on the next slide, um, and then run it there and test it. And this process, cross-compilation, downloading to the embedded device, testing it there, how do you reboot an embedded device when you crash that? That's actually another thing. This is usually the reset button, if there is any. Um, you may, sometimes it's, um, I've been in projects where I had to take out the battery of the phone when I crashed it. So <coughs> this process is quite cumbersome. It can't really be avoided unless you have an embedded device that is so powerful that you can compile directly on it via a connection to that. But then this is not really like embedded development anymore. Then it resembles a lot more uh, like desktop development. So because this process is quite cumbersome, that's why Qtopia Core comes with a very, very valuable tool, and that's the so-called QVFB, the virtual frame buffer. The virtual frame buffer uses, uses a, um, or provides an emulation of an embedded device, and you can actually specify the screen that you have, the hardware buttons that you have, be it a phone or a PDA or something else, with so-called skins on the virtual frame, frame buffer, but it runs on your desktop system, on your Linux system on which you do the development. So that means that not only can you reuse 
all your API skills from desktop development, you can actually do a lot of the de design like in desktop development mode with a desktop version of Qt, but you can even test run your application, your embedded application in the virtual frame buffer, and then you don't even need cross-compilation because that runs, just runs on your desktop CPU. So eventually, of course, you won't get around to downloading your code to the device and trying it there. But many things like, does the screen look good? And uh, does it work? And if I click here, do I actually get what I want? You can just test that in the virtual frame buffer. And that's, of course, a lot more convenient than having to go through the cross-compilation and downloading to the device steps all the time. So that really cuts down on development time. So I strongly advise to use that. I do not condone, however, to live with the virtual, be happy with the virtual frame buffer from the start to the project until two days before it's going to be shipped. That is playing with fire. You want to have your tool chain set up you want to make sure that you are able to cross-compile binaries, that you're able to download them to your device and run them there. Write a very simple version. Write an MTQ main window, for example. Download that on your device, start it there, make sure you can actually start it there. And then once you're sure about that, you can, be ha you can actually be happy with a virtual frame buffer, and maybe once a week you check whether it still runs fine on the device. So how do I get the binaries on the device? Well, if you have the opportunity um, then we assume the embedded device runs Linux because otherwise Qtopia Core wouldn't run on it anyway. Well, if it runs Linux, it might actually not be too unlikely that you can run an SSH daemon on the embedded device. And then the embedded device, at least for connection purposes, um, works just, just like any other computer on your network. You can use SSH, SSH to actually log into it. You get a shell, a terminal shell on your device can issue commands there because it's just running Linux. It's running a stripped down version of Linux and embedded Linux, but still Linux with the commands that you know from Linux development, which you need to have <coughs> anyway. Um, so once you're there, then you have an SSH daemon running. You can also do SCP to copy the binaries to the device. Then you've made a huge step. But getting to that stage may not always be trivial. How do you get the whole thing started? How do you get a Linux on the device anyway? You may have to fiddle with things like, is that a question in the back? Yeah. Excuse me? Uh, the question was, why not just to use the SD card on the device? Well, yeah, that sort of moves the problem from getting it to the device to getting it onto the SD card. If you have a reader writer connected to your um, computer systems, and for example, some desktop computers like some of the HP Pavilion computers, for example, they have SD card slots in the desktop PC. Then, of course, um, that, would, uh, that would solve that part of the problem, yes. It doesn't solve the part of the problem that you need to get an operating system running on the device in the first place, which is where you get into all those boot bootloader things. Often you can use things like, that sounds like it's something from the middle of the 80s, and in fact it is. It's actually rather than that, late 70s more. X modem, Z, um, Z modem protocol. Um, that's how you, that's often built into um, into the um, into the prom of the embedded device, so you can use that way to get an uh, an initial operating system onto the device. This is this is hard stuff. The good thing is you only need to solve it once for a device. And the problem is I can't really be very specific about this here because it differs totally from device to device, from phone maker to phone maker, from PDA maker to PDA maker, from embedded board maker to embedded board maker. If you get a decent connection, you can actually get a TCP connection. Another option would be that you can mount, NFS mount the device. So it really shows up in your file system and you just you issue a copy command to copy your binaries to the device. This is, in most of the projects I've been on, this was the hardest part of the whole project. And if you're lucky, the board or the device ships with an SDK that has all this set up for you already and has some documentation about how you get your binaries on the device and how you can start them. And that, I think, is also what the beauty of the green phone is going to be, because it decreases the barrier of entry into embedded development a lot, because you get all the stuff that you need. You get um, Qtopia Core, you get Qtopia, and um, you have all this, how do I get the thing, how do I get my own programs? Okay, now I've compiled them, how do I get them on the phone? How can I start them there? This big hurdle for everybody who's starting with embedded development, that's solved there for you. Also, if you go to some manufacturer, manufacturers buy an embedded board, like an evaluation board, um, they also come with these tools very often. So when, when, you, when you're still in the process of selecting hardware for your embedded process, 
like let's say you're building some kind of machine control and you have several boards to choose from. I would not only look at the, the CPU that's built onto the board and the external ports that's built onto the port, I'd also look at what kind of SDK does it come with and how many of those problems does the board maker already have solved for you? Because they needed to solve it anyway, otherwise they couldn't have tested the board. I had one case where I was able to buy a board out of the box and it came with an SDK and I said that installed that in, like uh, plugged that into my network. Um, the board actually had a network port and within 15 minutes I was up and running, was able to put a uh, binary onto that. Within 30 minutes I had ported Doom to that device and had it running on the evaluation board. That's, that's sort of, that's the kind of success that you want to have. It's okay if it takes a day too, but um, fiddling with that kind of stuff, getting it to start from scratch, that's pretty frustrating. So if you have been a Windows or a Macintosh developer and now you need to do Linux development, well, there's going to be an additional learning curve. This, you just have to face it. Um, you're working in another environment now, so the tools are different. Um, to some extent, they only have different names, really. And they work slightly differently, but sort of the concepts are the same. So when on Windows you have things like Visual Studio as your IDE, on Linux you could use KDevelop as your IDE. Um, or as you will see, if you're new into the Linux world, you'll see that many people actually don't use IDEs, but rather are fine with the command line and a good editor. The good editor is called Emacs. Everything else is not worth talking about. There's tools, instead of using, like on a Windows system where you would use a thing like Purify or Bounce Checker, um, on Linux you have a tool called Valgrind, which is a terrific open source tool for memory profiling application, finding leaks and memory corruptions. Um, it's not as polished, it doesn't have as, as spiffy icons as Purify has, but it definitely finds the, the, the same kinds of problems in your code. Kcash Grind is another tool from that Valgrind family, which does profiling for you and uh, gives you a very thorough view on how your application behaves at runtime by letting you drill into the data, sort the data in different ways. Um, it has different kinds of graphical views where you can drill down, okay, this is where I spend my time, let me click on that blob here, and then you go deeper down into it. So that's also a very useful tool. One of the nice things in the Linux world is that most of those tools are actually free. Another question is, well, you certainly need to do some debugging. Do you want to do that on the device or on the desktop host? Debugging on the device, is that possible at all? Well, if you can SSH into the device, have a remote shell there, um, you might be able to install a debugger there. It requires that a debugger, which is usually GDB on the Linux systems, but there are also commercial debuggers available, that the debugger supports the hardware in question. If that is not possible, then, well, you have to make do with a desktop host. Um, you have to run your program in the virtual frame buffer and debug in there, which usually works just fine because what you're going to debug most of the time are logical errors anyway, and they will occur on the desktop, in the virtual frame buffer, and on the embedded device in just the same way. So I'd actually go one step back even. If I have to debug a logical error, I'd not even use the virtual frame buffer and it being in embedded mode. I just recompile my program for the desktop and just debug it as a desktop program, which is likely to be a lot simpler even. Okay, so they say that computers get more powerful all the time. And, of course, that's true. We have uh, amounts of memory and we have CPU uh, clock frequencies that we didn't even dream about five years ago. But if you make the move from a desktop system to an embedded system, you all of a sudden find that, oh, this is a huge step back, actually. You go from, is there any computer that ships with less than half a gigabyte of RAM today? maybe a quarter gigabyte, but I don't think you can buy anything less than that. Um, well, if you're on an embedded device, I would say that the typical thing you can find is 64 megabytes of flash memory. Some have more. There are also some that have, that have like 128 or even more. But 64 megabyte is still, and actually has been for uh, quite some time, the typical amount of memory you found in an embedded device. And in the phone world, especially if you have a cheap consumer market phones, it could actually be even less. The reason for that is that flash memory is a lot more expensive to produce than standard RAM as you find it in a desktop computer. And that's why the, um, the evolution curve of the amount of memory available on an embedded device using flash memory is not as steep as it is on a desktop. 
So while you can, probably can expect that in two years from now you'll have more than 64 megabytes, it's not like in two years from now that it will have quadrupled like it has on a desktop system. But what do you actually need to get into those 64 megabytes of flash? Well, the operating system, apparently, there needs to be some sort of Linux. How much does that take you? Can get it down to six, eight megs, maybe. You need to have Qtopia Core, Qtopia if you use it. Fonts, which you take for granted, but which you actually need to download onto the, the embedded device. Fonts take quite a lot of space. I'll talk more about fonts later. And of course, well, there was the application you were going to write to begin with, and that needs to go onto the device as well. So um, squeezing that into 64 megabytes of flash is reputably a challenge, and it forces you to be um, it forces you to be quite conservative about memory consumption. When you configure a Linux system, um, those of you who haven't worked with Linux before, in a Linux system you actually have the option of turning on different things in your kernel or turning them off and just sort of by default you turn off just about everything you have the hardware for because it doesn't really matter if you have half a gigabyte in your computer anyway. On an embedded system you turn off everything by default that you don't absolutely need when you configure the operating system for that device. Also, the RAM is another question. RAM is cheap, but it's cheap in terms of the amount of money that it costs to produce, but it's not cheap in terms of power consumption. So the, um, the amount of power consumed from the built-in batteries in the device is pretty much linear um, to, uh, to the amount of RAM that you have. So if you have the same battery, you put in twice the amount of RAM, your battery is only going to last half as long. Would anybody accept a phone with a battery that lasts only six hours today? If you have 12 hours maybe now? Say, okay, uh, if my phone has 64 megabytes of RAM. Um, manufacturer, you're, you're making a million phones for me, so I can tell you what to do, put in 128 megabytes, and they will tell you, well, unless you put in a better battery, you'll only have six hours battery runtime. It's probably not what you want. So even with the RAM, you have to be pretty conservative. And that means that in better development, you can't just go, ah, I just create those objects here at application startup so I have them around all the time. No, in embedded development, you want to get rid of, every, of all the objects that you don't need, which of course gets you into another problem because it means that <coughs> you need to create objects on demand and of course you have a weaker CPU typically on embedded systems. So this balance of, it's, it's not the same balance of time and memory anymore, or rather it has it has a different challenge to it. If you're an embedded system, you can say, okay, I can trade memory for time by, um, just, by just saying, okay, I create all those objects ahead, I just put up a nice splash screen with some animation in it, and nobody will notice that it takes a second, the application takes a second longer to start, and I have all the objects, all the dialogues created ahead, and then they're just there when you, when you need to fire them up. That's something you can't typically do in an embedded device. Again, remember that I'm talking about handheld things like phones, PAs, all, all those kinds of things. I'm not talking about a big, fancy machine control that has similar hardware as a desktop system because, the, again, their development has similar properties as a desktop system. Another hardware limitation. Embedded devices do not necessarily have a floating point unit. When was the last time you had a desktop system that didn't have a floating point unit? Try to think back. When was that? When was the last time you could buy one? All the Pentiums had one. I tried to figure it out, and I think the last Intel CPU, Intel desktop CPU that you could buy without um, a floating point unit was the 486SX. And I think that must have been in 1991 or 92 that, that was available. So maybe 15 years ago, you didn't have a floating point unit. So what does that mean? Well, maybe saying goodbye to draw org and thin is a bit hard, because you can, of course, use them, but you need to be prepared that anything that is floating point has to be done in software. You can pretty much count on a software emulation being available. There are soft flow packages. Um, I think the, as far as I know, even the Linux kernel has some soft flow emulation built in. So you have floating point operations, but they are going to be a lot more expensive than on a desktop system. So that's something you just you want to be a little bit more careful with than you would be in desktop development. There's one thing that can help you get more out of your graphics performance on the device, and that's accelerated graphics drivers. Qt Embedded 3 was very good about that. It had a very nice structure for writing your own accelerated graphics drivers, and you get good, huge performance boosts out of that. 
we've tried that uh, with a couple of um, boards and using the, the standard VGA driver and then compared to a driver that actually used machine or used assembler language to write data into the direct ports on the graphics hardware, that was a big improvement. Qtopia Core as in, in, in Incarnation 4 doesn't have that at this time, unfortunately. It's going to be reintroduced at some point um, when I can't really say you would have to ask Qtopia product management for that. So, but that's actually a step back that you can't use accelerated graphics right now, but it, it has to come back in at some point. A typical problem when you do animations is the frame rate problem. You can't get the frame rate that you want, so how do you do your animation um, without having visible skips in the animation? We had um, part of uh, a package that we are selling is a dialog that lets you open different sections and they open smoothly, or at least they are supposed to open smoothly. But what kind of frame rate can you get on different computers? Some, some is using this on a P4 with insane amount of, proc, uh, of uh, CPU power. Somebody's maybe using that on a, uh, much, on a much older computer. And so you need to skip some of the frames in the animation. And how you do, do you do that and still make it look smooth? Until very recently, that has been a fairly hard problem. Qt 4.2 has introduced a new class called Qt Timeline that can actually help you to compute how to do a smooth animation. And it can even do things like the animation starts slowly at one side, goes faster in the middle, and then ends slowly again to the other side. So if you're doing anything with animation on limited hardware, Qt Timeline is something you definitely want to look at. Next challenge, screen real estate. When was the last time you used any computer with less than 1024 times 768? Pretty much everybody seems to have 1600 times 1200 or more these days. Um, even on a laptop, 1024 times 768 is really the smallest amount that comes out of the box. Um, normal PDA resolution, 240 times 320. Sometimes you get VGA if you're lucky, but often you have to make do with that, with a quarter of it. Get out, your, get out your cell phone, will you? Look at the screen and try to figure out what kind of res, re, resolution you have there. So now, if you think, I have this limited amount of pixels. Previously, when you run an application, you said an application always has in its main menu, it has a menu bar, it has an amount of toolbars, and it has a status bar, and there is some, there is some uh, document central area in it. That's also how the whole QMain window class is constructed. You still could do that on an embedded device. But if you only have a vertical resolution of 320 pixels, and you take 20 pixels of that for the menu bar, you take another 20 pixels of that for the toolbar, and you take 16 pixels of that for the, <coughs> for the status bar, that's altogether 56, 56 pixels out of 320. That's about one-sixth of the screen real estate, one-sixth of the vertical screen real estate that you lose. So you need to ask yourself, can I afford that? Very likely, you can't. If you're working on an already established environment, like you're writing a new application for an existing phone, there are very likely to be style guides that say, okay, your toolbars are gonna to be this high and the icons are gonna be this high and you don't use a menu by any way or you have context menu buttons or something like that. If you're doing your own design, if you're starting on a clean page, like you buy some embedded board to build it into a machine, then you actually have to do these considerations yourself. How much can, of those, all those graphical niceties can you actually afford? Because, well, your application still has a purpose. It's going to display some data or let you enter a piece of text or something. How do you actually, uh, how do you, how are you able to perform that in the amount of screen real estate that you have? And then you say, okay, well, I'll just make the font small and uh, I'll, make, um, I'll make the icons very small. But how small can you actually get those and still have them readable? And maybe you have very good eyes, but what about your users? How old are your users? How are their eyes? This is all things, again, you take for granted on a desktop system. Oh, I've got enough space. I just put my icons in there. If, if my users want larger icons, they go to, the, go to the view menu and check the large icons box. Very unlikely to work on an embedded system. If you work on one of the applications where you actually had the desktop application first and port it to an embedded device, maybe only port a subset for it, it's very likely that you have a couple of windows and dialogs 
that are large, that themselves are larger than the screen real estate you have on the embedded device. So you actually need to review all your dialogues and look at that, okay, how can I fit that in the limited space that I have? Even if on, let's say, a phone, it's very typical that a dialogue is just like a page that overlays everything and uh, fills the whole screen real estate. But 240 times 220 is still not much. Try, try how many push buttons do you get in that, actually. So um, you need to re review the layout of all your dialogues. You need to split them up. You need to consider whether you can use tabs. Does it work with the input devices? Input devices is something else we're going to talk about. Um, you need to split them up in several dialogues. Can you afford to just drop a couple of options because they don't make sense on the embedded device or because you make a deliberate decision, I'll drop these options because I can't fit them in the dialogue? It could actually be that you get your dialogue simpler and that the desktop application can benefit from that as well because most desktop applications, including the ones that I write, have overloaded dialogues with way too many controls in them. You've probably all heard about the good rules of UI design. Um, there are some very good books um, about that, like um, um, if you want to read one book about that, I recommend GUI Bloopers by Jeff Johnson, which is a terrific book about UI design. And the rules that you learn about UI design, they still apply on an embedded device. So it's not like you can say, okay, I have this limited screen real estate, so I just run Berserk and put in my icons, cram in my icons in any way just so that I get them on the screen. Well, no, your users won't let you get away with it. You still need to have a decent layout. You still need to have a good flow through your dialogue. It still needs to be obvious how things are grouped. That's not a, it's not an excuse that you don't have the space. Okay, I promised that I would be bitching about fonts. Well, it's not like on a desktop system, if you want a new font, what do you do? You just drop a TTF font, TTF file into the font uh, for a folder on your system, and then it's automatically there. It doesn't work that simple on an embedded system. Qtopia Core has defined its own font format, so-called QPF. I think that's short for Cube Portable Fonts, I guess. And that's a compressed format that is, in particular, very space-saving if you're using a small amount of glyphs from a font. But if you have a large font, like you have a font that covers several, page, several Unicode pages, and you put that into your QPF file, then the QPF file is actually going to be quite large, even though it is compressed. So, so when, you, when you pick the fonts, you need to be, you need to be care very careful about how many fonts am I going to pick at all. Maybe I can just get away with one font with serifs and one without. Maybe I don't even need the one without. And uh, do I really need fancy fonts? If I put a word processor on my PDA, are the, uh, if you write a word processor for PDAs, are the users of your PDA, are they really going to use different fonts or are they just using the PDA to scribble so quickly something down without caring about fonts and boldface and stuff? And you need to think about which glyphs are you going to use. Do you really need the full Unicode set? Like, do you need any kind, do you need Klingon fonts on your device? Cut down everything you don't need. Another problem, and that's something we have in a in a consulting project for an American customer that we've been involved in, it turned out that it was very, very hard to, even if you want to take a large sum of money in your hands, it turned out to be very hard to go and buy a font that A, looked good, and B, even worked in a limited resolution. There are font suppliers that have like 6,000 fonts in their library where you go with your credit card to the web website and buy the font file, but you have to look long and hard in order to find a font that actually works on a limited resolution because most fonts were designed for desktop systems and were made like to, be lo to look perfect or at least very good if you have any resolution that you want. Yes? Um, QPF fonts are, let me see that I get this right now. QPF fonts come out of, they are compressed bitmap renderings out of fonts, because you can make, for example, you can take a Unix PDF font, turn that into a QPF, or you can take a TTF, which is then rendered into a QPF font. So no matter what the, uh, um, no matter what the original font was, it's going to, it's taken down to, um, it's taken down to a um, QPF font. Qtopia Core actually does support TTF fonts. 
it comes or it, ha it integrates the free type font rendering engine. So you could use TTF fonts if you want at the expense of using the additional CPU cycles for the font rendering, which may be quite expensive. Any more questions? You really have to shout because I can hardly see you if you raise your arm. Just shout or holler or yodel if you want to ask any questions, all right? Input. How do you provide input to your application? You probably don't have a mouse. Maybe you have a stylus like the green phone does or a PDA typically does. Um, it's very likely that you can't do drag and drop or even if it's available. Um, earlier versions of Qtopia or of Qt Embedded didn't even support drag and drop. The current version supports it, but it's questionable whether the input devices that your users are going to have available uh, will actually make it feasible to use drag and drop. Sometimes they have like mechanisms that you hold the stylus down and uh, for a second or so, and then that's, that means grabbing something and dragging something else. That is very unlikely to be a very useful tactile user interface, especially if you want to, if you want to use your PDA while you're standing in a bus and it's going like this all the time, and now you keep the stylus, keep the stylus on the device for a second without lifting it. So you may probably have some, um, some sort of mouse, like cell phones these days typically have some kind of little joystick in there. So it's very likely that you have a pointing device even if you don't have a stylus. But be prepared that you don't have, um, that you are, will not be able to use drag and drop. Be prepared that uh, you probably do not, very likely do not have three buttons available. Maybe you have two. Uh, typically, you only have one, often the joystick, just pressing the joystick down. That's, gonna be, that's not going to be a hard thing for Mac users, which have lived with one mouse button for a long time and still have survived for some reason that's unknown to me. And, um, and so that's also, this is something there where you need to consider what are your users going to do with that? What kind of environment are, you going to, are they going to work with that? Are they able to perform complicated precision tactile operations on the device? pointing at a very, sort of at a very small area. We've talked about screen real estate. So I said, you need to be careful you don't have much of it, but you can't make the buttons too small either, because then it's gonna be very difficult to point to the right thing, especially if you're on that bus and it's going like this all the time. So that's um, another challenge. Can you use context menus? Cell phones often have a, um, have a context button that has become pretty much standard these days. So that's something you may have available and this was only about mouse input, but what about text input? How is text entered on your device? If you're, if you're lucky, you have something like the BlackBerry or the, uh, the Sharp Zoris, for example, where you have one of those small keyboards built in where you go with your thumbs like this. Looks like you have Palsy, but you're really typing on, the, uh, <coughs> on that device. Then, of course, then you can say, okay, any text input is possible that the keyboard allows. But what if you have a cell phone? Well, you have those you have those multi-click things. You have the T9 input scheme. Uh, T9 is this um, language-dependent thing where you type in a few characters and then looks up in a dictionary which words start with those characters. And um, never really works for me. I always turn this off and then back to multi-click because sort of the words that I use are not the ones that the that dictionaries contain. And they don't contain proper names anyway. You may be able to use an on-screen keyboard. Qtopia Core comes with on-screen keyboards that you can just activate and show on the keyboard, uh, on the screen. Um, all gets a different aspect, and that's actually something we are trying to solve now for a customer, and which turns out to be very hard if you want to get that on the Asian market. How do you do input if you have several hundred characters, like in, uh, like in a language like Chinese? Well, you don't have several hundred characters. Uh, you have... Uh, was that uh, 55,000, I think, characters in standard Mandarin Chinese. But an ordinary educated Chinese person only uses 2,000 of them, so that simplifies the problem a bit. Question? That's not built into Qtopia, um, Qtopia Core uh, as it comes out of the box. There are, and that's something we're currently researching for a customer, there are add-on vendors that provide those input methods. 
And um, so you need to integrate that with Qtopia. And it has been done before, but it's not something you get out of the box. And there are apparently, there are different vendors for these kinds of input methods. So if you're looking at the Asian market, that's another thing that uh, you need to consider and that is that you need to sort of prepare in your project plan that you need to spend some time on that. More questions about input? Okay, so far I've really only talked about embedded development pretty much independent of Qtopia Core. So here's a little bit more about Qtopia Core, how it actually works. On, on a desktop system, the operating system provides graphics access. On Windows, you have the, have the GDI. On Unix, you have the X server. On Mac, you have uh, whatever that is called. And uh, on an embedded system, by default, you don't have anything. So Qtopia Core actually needs to provide that. And that is done by the so-called QWS, the Qt Windows Server, which is the first application, the first Qtopia Core application that is started on the device. So you start the first Qtopia core application with a special flag that says, fire up the Q Windows server. And that then mediates access to the screen and to the input devices. And then all subsequently started applications are started without that flag, and they connect to the Qt Windows server. That's done through a Unix domain socket. But that's something you don't really know about, need to know about most of the time. And uh, the, um, so the, Q, the QWS server really works like an X11 server on a, on a Unix system. It mediates access to the hardware, to the frame buffer. Um, we will see that there are ways of circumventing that actually. Um, it provides input events and feeds them into Qt. Why is it done this way? Well, as I said, the API is pretty much the same. So you want to be able to follow the same event-based pattern in Qt Embedded in Qtopia Core development as you do in desktop development. So there needs to be some sort of separate entity that collects the events from the hardware, from the keys that you have, from the stylus or whatever you have, and feeds that into the application. So that's why this, this split is done. And that's it, as long as you remember first, first application to start, started with that flag, that's the QWS, um, all the other ones will just connect to it then you don't really need to know much about this. Because sort of at the API level, what you're going to use most of the time, you don't need to be aware. Because this QWS just ensures that it just works like desktop Qt does. But uh, it's still, when you get weird error messages, when you start an application, um, and you don't really understand them, well, you may have no QWS running on your device. If you have a device which always has some sort of shell running, let's say you have a cell phone, a cell phone always has a, Whenever you turn it on, it has a program running already that has your background screen and uh, uh, takes incoming calls, maybe. Um, then that, of course, is the one that runs the QWS. And then if you fire up the notebook application, that would be one of those subsequent applications. And so the event loop in the client just reads data from the QWS server as the event loop on an X11 system or Windows system would do. Yes, please. Um, no, you, you, um, what is going to happen is if you, you can't, you need to do that outside the application really. Um, if you have a QWS running and you're trying to start another one, the application start will fail. If you don't have a QWS running and you try to start an application without firing up a QWS with it, application start will fail. But it's not something that you can do, you can't, um, at runtime, go from being a QWS to not being a QWS. So this first application that you've started, that is the QWS, needs to be around all the time until the other applications are shut down. So that's something you need to take care of. But it's something you need to, need to take care of, not in your C++ code, but rather in the environment like your startup scripts that fire up the application. Does that answer your question? Uh, that didn't sound convinced. Yeah, well, um, it's really something that is beyond the realm of the actual application development. It's more, more a question of system integration. 
It's at the sort of at the level where you take all the applications that you've written and integrate them with the operating system, fire up the first application maybe when you turn on the device. So that's even if you're the one who do it, you do it with a different hat on. Am I over running over my time? No? Okay. I usually am. That's why I'm asking. Okay. How does um, the how does the access to the frame buffer, the graphics buffer, where the actual bits go, the graphic, the, the, the pixels go, how, is, how does that work in Qtopia Core? Well, you always have a QScreen subclass. QScreen is the um, abstract base class for everything that can serve a frame buffer. And there are different kinds of frame buffer classes. The one that you typically use on Qtopia Core version 4 is the QLinux FB screen, which accesses the Linux frame buffer, then the hardware access to that frame buffer. That's something that is not provided by Qtopia Core, but something that is provided by the operating system, usually by means of the device file slash, slash dev slash FB0. But um, the Q screen class, the Q screen subclass, then um, provides the access to that frame buffer to and integrate that with QPainter so that you can use the standard QPainter methods like draw text, draw line, draw point, and so on in order to draw on the screen. In Qt Embedded 3, there were a lot more of those subclasses because there was one for every accelerated driver that came with the system, and you could actually write plugins that plugged in more QScreen subclasses into the system, and that's something that, as I said, I expect to be back at some point. QDirect Painter is one of those few classes that you have in Qtopia Core that you don't have in the standard Qt desktop versions. And that's a class that lets you paint directly on the frame buffer circumventing the QWS. This really is, and please hear my words, that's a last ditch resort if you need to squeeze out the last bit of performance. Because you can get all kinds of weird effects if two applications try to do that at the same time. Mm -hmm. Um, what do you mean with multiple views? Multiple separate physical screens? Yeah. yeah. Then you would have one Q screen subclass per. You would have, first of all, the, the Linux kernel would have to provide a separate frame buffer access to each physical screen. And on each of those frame buffers, there would have to be one Q screen subclass. And you would have to. Um, how would that work? I think you would actually have to activate one or the other in order to tell which screen you draw on. Because um, the uh, Qtopia core, um, or the Qpainter rather, Qpainter doesn't know anything about different screens. So it's really in the screen subclasses. Um, I haven't really encountered that problem yet, but so my educated guess would be that you have to tell which one the subsequent drawing operations are going to operate on. Uh -huh. Like those clocks that are built for the clamshell, for example. Yeah, that, I guess that would, yeah, I, I would suppose that those are different frame buffers with different few screen objects on them. Interprocess communication. The wonderful thing about standards is that there are so many to choose from. And on desktop systems, there's a huge variety of standards. There's Corbar, there's DCOM, OE, DCOP, DBUS. Uh, what have you. On an embedded device, again, out of the box, you don't really have anything. And then it's good to know that Qtopia Core actually comes with a fairly rudimentary but totally workable inter-process communication mechanism. Why can it do that at all? Well, since the QWS, the Qt Windows Server, needs to be there and mediates access of all the applications anyway and transports events back to the application, well, it can just as well handle in the process communication. And Qtopia Core has a class that's called QCOP channel, which provides, that's a simple IPC replacement where you can send messages. Basically, you write your data into Qbyte array, stuff that into a QCOP channel. You can have several QCOP channels, and then the application at the other end can connect to a QCOP channel and be informed and just pull that byte array out. So that's 
That's a fairly simple, not very sophisticated, but um, definitely workable mechanism of talking between Qtopia core applications. <coughs> Sorry. Once you're looking into um, using the full Monty, the full Qtopia phone environment, you have a much more sophisticated mechanism that is an architecture that is service-based, that builds on QCOP channel, but uh, provides, provides different services that applications can connect to. It actually provides things like um, predefined channels, like there is an alarm service in the Qtopia environment, and your application can connect to that alarm service and make it do things. And if the, if the alarm clock application is not running, Qtopia will automatically fire it up. So that's at a much higher level of abstraction. With a, Qtop with a full Qtopia environment, we're not really sending byte arrays around anymore. We're sending semantic messages. But again, it's built on QCOP channels. So if you're not using Qto the full Qtopia, if you're just using Qtopia core, you could build something like that yourself. That's the area of the desktop services. Other things that you typically expect in a desktop environment these days is that you can fire up an email client and uh, a text editor. You, have, you, can, you don't have to, the application doesn't have to know, or a web browser, the application doesn't have to know what the web browser is. Especially with Qt 4.2, a whole set of desktop services was introduced into Qt. If you have a desktop environment where the application can say, okay, here's the HTML file, fire up the web browser, wherever it is, and I don't care whether the user has installed Internet Explorer or Firefox or Conqueror or whatnot. And that's something that, and again, on an embedded device you can't take for granted, but that Qtopia phone gives you. Because, it, again, it pro sort of provides the desktop environments for devices that don't have it yet. So Qtopia phone and other editions of Qtopia that will be available later take some of the hardness out of the embedded development because it reinstitutes some of the functionality that we are used to on the desktop environment, like desktop services. On the other hand, where I said Qtopia Core, Qt Desktop, the APIs are pretty much the same. Qtopia Phone is another set of APIs on top of that, so it's a completely new thing, set of things to learn. Of course, that's sort of the price you have to pay for the additional convenience, as always. Yeah, that's really all I um, was going to say. Uh, if you have any questions, I'll happily take them now. If not, by all means, if you have any questions later, contact me at my email address or check out our website. I'll be happy to take your questions now. <coughs>